thank you all for coming. I take it that you folks don't have basketball tickets, or maybe you do. Victor tells me his lab is here and that all of you will be treated to pizza afterwards. But um, so thanks very much for coming. And at, right. Uh, this is the spring 2009 Dean's Lecture Series. I'm, I'm Mike Whiteford. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And it is my very distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special event. Tonight's lecture is the sixth in the Dean's Lecture Series. The lecture highlights faculty excellence and achievement in the areas of teaching, discovery, and outreach in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. We have invited some of the most outstanding members of the LAS faculty to present lectures on their own and varied areas of scholarly expertise. We hope, of course, that this all helps to stimulate intellectual discussion among our college, university, faculty, staff, and students, and for the greater Iowa State community. Tonight's lecture is Professor Victor Lin. He joins a distinguished list of LAS faculty members who have been part of this series, which was inaugurated in 2006. The researchers and scholars have shared their knowledge on topics ranging from bamboo to baseball and from primates, primates to poets. The most recent, recent speaker was Dr. Peggy Mook, Associate Professor of Classical Studies in our Department of World Languages and Cultures. She presented her results of a very exciting bit of work that she's doing excavating an ancient Greek city on the island of Crete. And yes, she really does dig her work for the college. OK, uh, that's, <laughs> thank you very much. I will, <laughs> yes. And uh, we'll try one more time. Last spring, Lynn Clark, Professor, professor of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology bamboozled us with her lecture on woody bamboo plants, 75 of which she has had the honor of naming. Eli Rosenberg, professor and then chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, took to the mound to explain the physics of baseball. And prior to Eli, was Jill Preetz, Associate Professor of Anthropology, whose work was featured last year in the National Geographic magazine and on the PBS television show, Nova. Jill discussed her groundbreaking chimpanzee research in Senegal. And I wanna mention that Jill will be President Joffrey's spring 2009 Presidential University Lecture right here in this very room on March 2nd. Her presentation will begin at 8 p.m. And our very first Dean's Lecture Series speaker was Neil Bowers, now Emeritus Distinguished Professor in Liberal Arts and Sciences and Professor of English. His lecture was entitled Dead Poet Talking. Tonight's lecture will be equally informative and enlightening, although on a much, much, much smaller scale. Victor Lin, is a professor of chemistry at Iowa State University, and his talk tonight is entitled Nanotechnology, A Fantastic Voyage. Dr. Lin will discuss his work on nanotechnology, specifically research in mesoporous silica nanoparticles, or in other words, teensy eensy bits, and that is scientific jargon, of sand with lots of holes in them. Professor Lin is borrowing his title from the 1966 science fiction film, Fantastic Voyage. Some of you might remember that, but many of you in this room are probably too young to remember the movie where a submarine and crew are sh shrunken so small that they are injected into the bloodstream of an important scientist to repair his lethal blood clot. Professor Lin will explain how his research of nanoparticles, particles so itsy bitsy that millions are needed to stretch one yard is related to this old film. Victor Lin is from a long line of outstanding faculty researchers from the Iowa State University Department of Chemistry. And he is a national leader in the use of nanotechnology 
for many valuable and important purposes. Victor is a member of a team of Iowa State plant scientists and chemists who have successfully used nanotechnology to penetrate plant cell walls. The team was able to simultaneously deliver a genetic and a chemical that triggers the cell's expression with controlled precision. Think about the, the future prospects for that. He is also the inventor of a nanosphere-based catalyst that reacts to vegetable, with vegetable oils and animal fats with methyl to produce biodiesel fuel. Victor is the founder of a startup company that, is use, that he uses to produce and develop biodiesel technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me this evening in welcoming the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Spring 2009 Dean's Lecture Series to, this, to the podium, Dr. Victor Lin. First of all, let me thank Mike for the, uh, the very kind introductions. Um, so, you know, with all these outstanding speakers before me, so I'll try my best uh, to not to put you to sleep with chemistry. <laughs> so, um, so let me begin um, by sort of offer a little bit of explanation about the title of my talk. So Mike already gave you a pretty thorough description about the scientific, uh, well, this, the sci-fi movie that was made in 1966. And hopefully by the end of today's lecture, uh, I could convince you uh, a sci-fi movie could one day become a reality. Um, so um, let me first sort of say that to many people that this prefix nano means a lot of different things. Uh, for a scientific researcher like myself, um, you know, I first learned about this term when I was uh, a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the late 90s. And at that time, this, this term was used very wide, uh, widely and uh, by a lot of scientific uh, researchers or even industrial uh, entrepreneurs and uh, so on and so forth. And so, you know, when I first learned about this word, it's sort of like, it sounded like a buzzword to me. And so, you know, but I quickly learned about one thing when I started my uh, independent scientific research career here at Iowa State that this prefix nano uh, sometimes means uh, research funding. So, <laughs> so <laughs> let me just throw a few numbers uh, out to the audience. That in 2001, uh, in the United States, uh, we're talking about federal funding agencies. The total amount of the dollars that was used for, uh, to fund the nanotechnology research was $464 million. And that was a number back in the 2001. So in 2008, the new number came out. It's $1.5 billion. So as you can imagine, uh, this actually we not even reach the sort of the, the um, you know, it's not even the decade. And the scientific funding that's sort of been uh, used in this area has tripled. And so, and obviously the United States is not the only country that's sort of heavily invested in this area. Uh, Japan, a lot of European countries, and China, and so on and so forth, they are all sort of joined this, this, um, this interesting race to trying to uh, develop new nanotechnology. So to me, of course, that is an incentive. But as a basic scientist, I'm more interested in what this prefix could actually do for me in uh, providing something that could uh, be useful um, in a sort of a daily living. So, what is nano? So, um, tiny, tiny, itsy bitsy stuff is correct. Well, in fact, one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And so, this is the kind of thing that you typically see. In fact, I actually downloaded this picture from uh, just simply do, uh, did a Google search. And so, one thing I would like to point out to you is, is not just uh, looking at these different kind of a length scale, but the, uh, but these pictures. So we can actually see that, of course, that you know, uh, a, a human being is actually a, a few meters long. And then when you go to the other end of, of the spectrums, when we're talking about atoms, it's, a, uh, it's around a few Einstrom. And so you know, when I first started to use and put this prefix onto some of my grand proposal, some of my senior colleagues actually came to me and says that, well, you know, 
guess what? All chemists are actually playing in this length scale, meaning that every single molecule that a chemist will make falls into this length scale. So what's the big deal about nanotechnology? <laughs> meaning that you know, if you look at a simple molecule here, it could easily exceed this 10 Einstrom, meaning that it will be ab above one nanometer in length. So essentially, that sort of got me thinking, exactly what is the definition of nanotechnology? What is that word so different than the kind of conventional chemistry that we do on a daily basis? So it turns out, this def definitions of nanoscience and nanotechnology was sort of, a, was a moving target a few years ago. And the most recent definition by the National Science Foundation in the United States, it's in this sort of shaded area. So it's anything that's above one nanometer but below 200 nanometers falls into their definitions of nanoscience. So with this shaded area, I would like you to actually take a look at what kind of object that falls into this size regime. So one thing I'd like to point out to you is that this is a virus. Okay, and later I'll, I'll explain to you why I particularly would like to draw your attention to this object here. But some of the bigger artificial molecule, for example, polymer, also falls into this, this, uh, this range. So now let's think about why is this thing such a big deal? Why would the government spend so many dollars into this area of research? So who started this whole thing? It turns out, actually, there was a very famous sentence there is plenty of room at the bottom. It uh, was actually first said by uh, Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel laureate, uh, won his Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965. And the amazing part is that not only that, you know, this is his first, uh, this is the first photo uh, that shows up on his badge when he was a uh, Los Alamos scientist. And then, you know, when he became the faculty member at Caltech, and, you know, then this is one of the privilege you get to be a faculty member. You could point at people. <laughs> and, you know, and then he obviously did a lot of thinking. So what actually intrigues me was that the, um, this, this, this statement was actually made before he won the Nobel Prize. So the first nanotechnology lecture was actually started with the questions. Why can't we write the 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia of the Britannica on the head of a pen? Okay, so it turns out, uh, I'm just going to move this thing because I like to walk around. <laughs> well, it turns out I can't, so it's okay. Um, so this, this lecture, this talk was given at an um, after-dinner talk. Um, that this is actually December 29th, 1959. So notice the date is actually before he got Nobel Prize. And this was a, a sort of an annual uh, American Physic uh, Physics Society meeting at Caltech. So what this whole talk was about was that he was actually giving this talk and describing how one could actually make a molecular machine that with atomic pres uh, you know, precision that allow you to use this machine to do a lot of different things. So this whole speech actually is quite inspirational to me, that is to say, well, this actually implies you don't just make a molecule that falls into this nanometer size regime. The true definition of nanotechnology is perhaps whatever the product, should it be chemical, should it be a particle, should it be uh, different kinds of material or even the biological system. The, the real meanings of nanotechnology is that this object must function in the multiple way. So obviously I was not the only one that sort of came up with this definitions of nanotechnology. In fact, there's a sci-fi versions of nanotechnology as Mike described. So it actually took me a while to sort of get these posters and, um, oh great, thank you. So this is indeed a story about four men and a woman that they jumped into a submarine 
and this whole thing get be, be reduced in size into something that is so small, it's smaller than a blood cell, that actually get injected into the bloodstreams. So essentially, this whole movie can boil down to a bloodstream's nanomatics, okay, or nanosurgeons. So these things will go in and repair any kind of uh, damage that, you know, when they encounter these, these uh, red blood cells or immune system, then they becomes, you know, uh, this becomes such a sort of dangerous journey for them. And so, is this kind of a nanosurgeons or nanomatics just a pipe dream? And if you think about, if you uh, behave like a sort of simple-minded scientist like myself, I start to analyze what are the prerequisites that's needed to build such kind of machines. And in fact, this is actually the, drive, uh, the, the driving force for me to actually start my independent research. So the first thing you need to do is that you must create something that's capable of carrying and releasing various cargoes. Okay? The second thing you need to have, well, if you put it in a cartoon fashion, if you could actually have a cap, you know, micro capsule like this that allow you to release or load different kinds of cargo, and this will be a very interesting machine. The second thing you want to be able to achieve is that this object that you create should be structurally stable to protect the cargo. Okay? So something looks like that. If you could actually have a sort of like a tiny little space shuttle that actually instead of flying the space, but actually travel in your bloodstreams, this will be ideal. The third thing is that obviously you have to be able to do a lot of different functions, meaning that this object has to be multifunctional. The fourth thing is that this object needs to know where to go. So it has to be target directing. So based on the four prerequisites that I outlined here, this is almost like we're buying a car, right? You know, you need a car that could carry and release you. The door should open, you know, when you want them to be open. The car should be a Volvo, okay? So, <laughs> or a Mercedes, so that could protect you upon collision, okay? You gotta have the headlights, you gotta have the windshield wiper, you gotta have a lot of different things, multifunctional. These days, a good car will give you a GPS. So, essentially, what you're doing here is buying a car. The only difference is that if you want to apply this kind of things in the biological system, then this object must be biocompatible. What that means is that when this object traveling and encountering a lot of different biological species, it better not trigger any kind of immune response. Otherwise, it will bring harms to the biological objects. So, with this as the motivation, can we actually start doing something? And um, as a sort of a bio-inorganic chemist, oftentimes when I want to do something, I will, I will always go to Mother Nature and ask for some advice. And one of the things that I figured out is that, is there such a nano delivery system in nature? As I mentioned to you, virus turns out to be right around 100 nanometer in size. So it's a nano object, okay? And turns out virus is a great delivery vehicle. So I would like to show you a movie that I downloaded from NSF. This is actually a bacterial phage T4 virus ready to infect its host cells. So here's the movie. You can see this very strange looking, almost like an alien spaceship object that's ready to land on a host cell. And the landing is actually quite sophisticated. So they got these peptides and the protein that actually binds to the surf cell surface receptors. So these are the proteins or the, uh, or the, um, the, the peptides. And then a secondary landing gear also touch upon the surface. Then they start drilling a hole. Okay, injecting the RNA into the inside of the cells. Okay. So you can see that it's so efficient, some viruses could even establish a tubular structure that allow these uh, species inside of the cells go back into the virus. So this is actually quite sophisticated, right? 
So this is an object that fulfill all those prerequisites that I just mentioned to you. So how come we cannot use the virus as a nano you know, surgeons? Turns out, well, virus got its own agenda, right? So not virus is all good, okay? And oftentimes, however, there is a take home message. That is, if I could shrink the nano delivery vehicle that I want to build to this size regimes, just like virus, it is quite smart. It could bypass your immune response. That's why every time you have a viral infection, the doctor just look at you and says, go home, drink more water, <laughs> okay? So, unlike bacteria, which will trigger the immune response, virus is actually quite smart. So perhaps there is a reason why they specifically, you know, sort of define themselves and evolve themselves into that size regime. Now, how, because we cannot use the virus directly, can we make some sort of artificial structure that allow us to actually embark in such a kind of journey and build this nano delivery device? Well, again, let's ask Mother Nature. Is there a three-dimensional stable structures that with high volume and with high surface area so allow you to accommodate a lot of gas molecules? Well, turns out we don't have to look very far. This, I'm sure everybody in the audience knows, recognize this is a honeycomb. And one thing that amazes me is that a beehive, this is essentially the building block of the beehive. And as we all know, a small beehive such as this one oftentimes accommodate millions of bees. So what it means is that if you utilize the space three-dimensionally, one can actually build something very stable, yet highly uh, accommodating, that allow you to pack a lot of different things into a very small unit volume. So with that, I started to go to the whiteboard and start drawing something like this. If I could only build a device, let's, take, let's say I will have the ability to build this nano honeycomb. And would, then I could hide these drug molecules inside of these uh, pores. And then if I could actually put a tiny little cap there so that they won't leak out. And then if this cap could be smart enough, when I want them to open, then they can open. And that would be ideal. Then I could put some side directing stuff. For example, antibody that, that is well known that will recognize a specific receptor on the cell surface. So this whole device will be side directing. Now today, I hope to convince you, we could indeed make some of the structure that looks like this, that the, the release can be triggered by some naturally produced chemical or even using a simple photon irradiation. Now, as I mentioned, right, the virus didn't just take the drug to the local tissue. They actually drill a hole and then inject the cargo inside of the cells because that's the most efficient way to get your cargo into uh, the, the destination. And there are several challenges. If you look at the animal cells, this is the animal cells. It has this lipid bilayer that's called the cellular membrane. And the penetration of this is not so easy. And if you think about animal cell being difficult, wait until you run into the plant cells. In addition to the cell membrane, you have the cell wall that are even thicker. And so how can you ask your nano device to be able to penetrate these natural barriers? So the challenge number one is that can you deliver functional molecule through the cell membrane or penetrate the cell wall. The second challenge is that can you control the timing and the amount of the intracellular release? Because if you bring in just a few molecules inside, it won't do its job. Oftentimes, the biogenic concentration is right around micromolar to millimolar. That is to say, you know, one thousandth of a molar or one millionth of a molar concentration. So can you accomplish this? These are grand challenges. So one of the things that I find myself lucky was that uh, there was a paper that was published in Nature uh, over a decade ago in 1992 by a group of Exxon, uh, a group of scientists that works at Exxon, uh, sorry, Mobile. 
this is before they merge, so I always got confused. Uh, so mobile scientists, they actually take a very simple soap molecule. The surfactant molecule, when you introduce them into water, they self-assemble and form these structures that call micelles, where they hide the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail in the core regime, and then they, all the circle, the open circle representing the charge groups that are water soluble, they faced the, the water. So this whole structure could allow these bipolar molecule to form the unique structure in an aqueous solution. Then what they do is they take these soap molecule, they form these almost like the bubbles, they change the pH, they change the concentration, they change the shape of the surfactant micelle in, from something spherical to something that looked like a rod. And then, just like how you would pack cigarettes, by con controlling the concentration, you can pack them into an array. And then, what they do is they throw some chemical that they will form the silica structure. So the silica, as you know, is silicon dioxide. It's the fundamental building block of sand. So essentially, what they end up doing is that they make a composite material. So the walls are made of silica where these, the, in between these walls, they actually encapsulate the surfactant molecule. Then upon calcination, meaning that if you burn these organic species away, or you do the you know, acidic extraction, meaning that you could, you could do some dilution and extraction, you could extract those organic molecules out, you end up having an inorganic structure. And this inorganic structure, it has this unique structure that looks just like the honeycomb. And the amazing part that I found was that the surface area of this material, one single gram of molecule give you a football field. So above 900 square meter per gram. So which means that if you could use this thing as a solid support, one could not only allow a lot of molecule, if you do the surface chemistry, you put some functional groups on the, on the surface of this material, it will give you a lot of active sites. So I found this material to be very intriguing and so I follow the recipe just like so uh, many other scientists out there. I could indeed make large quantities of this material. Okay? And if you put these things under a um, transmission electron microscope, so this is a microscope that allows you to look at almost to the atomic levels of the resolutions of how these atoms are arranged. And one sees this. You see some of the light color dots, you see some of the darker gray and black areas. So these light colored dots represent the openings of the uh, vacuum, meaning the channel, the pores. So we're looking down the pores. So if you pay attention to some of this region, you notice that these light dot circle are packed in the hexagonal symmetry, meaning just like honeycomb, these things are actually monodispersed in size, meaning the, the size of the openings are almost the same. They are actually packed in a very ordered fashion. The bad part, however, is that when I zoom out, when I start to take a look you know, at the particle morphology, meaning the shapes of these particles, turns out to be quite bad. So here's the scale bar of one micron, so one millionth of a meter. You can actually see that some particles are large, some are small, they're fused together. So suffice to say, this is a amorphous material. So, you can find some nanoparticles among the, the, this bunch, but the majorities are much larger than that. So turns out, when I searched in the literature, and I did a pretty thorough job, before us, no one ever used this material for biomedical application. And it turns out, when we did the first experiment in our laboratory, we put some animal cells, and we tried to culture them on top of these silicon particles. Turns out, they get wiped out within a couple of weeks. The biocompatibilities of this material turns out to be quite bad. That was the first challenge that we ran into. So we knew right then we need to fix this problem. So you may ask this question, right? I mean, I don't know about elsewhere, but you know, I have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. Sometimes follow them to the playground. And a lot of time you see them like to play sand. And some of the kids are smarter not to put the sand in their mouth. But some of them like to lick them up. Okay? Nobody died. Okay? So one asks this question. So how come 
you know, the, 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 the particle that are made of the same chemical uh, compositions to be so toxic and cause the damage to the animal cells in our case. And the other thing I noticed is that a lot of good things that happened before I was born, that's what some, one lesson that I learned, that is, in 1966, people already published a paper in Nature about this hemolysis effect. That is to say, if you inject the amorphous silica, just like those particles that I showed you before, into the bloodstream, what happened was, when they encountered the red blood cells, the red blood cells were severely damaged. All the internal contain, uh, contain like hemoglobins and the, these, these nice cargoes within the red blood cells got leaked out. So it is, what it means is that the amorphous silica has the ability to lyse the cells and then rupture the membrane so that these red blood cells will die. So this hemolysis effect was well documented in, even in 1966. So many of my colleagues started to ask me this question. Why on earth do you want to use sand as a biomedical delivery vehicle? And it turns out, you know, I have my reason because not only I'm an inorganic chemist, well, that's the reason I told my senior colleagues, uh, but the true reason is because I would like to build something structurally stable when you already taken these things. When it goes through the extreme exilities of your stomach, it will not get destroyed so that all those pressurous drugs or a target will not get decomposed. Turns out, to make a long story short, we found a way to make this happen. I'll just give you the results and spare you with the details of the chemistry slides. Turns out, we, by using different kinds of chemical precursor, we can make a whole range of different shapes and sizes, starting from tubes, fat noodle, saphir, raspberry, bars, you name it. We can make it. So, these particles, in fact, have a very unique porous structures. So shown here are two TEM, again, the transmission electron micros micrograph of these particles. To your right, we're looking down the opening of the pores again. So hopefully you can see the light color dot. They're packed in the hexagonal symmetry. The size of these, these dots are identical. That is to say, this is a very monodispersed uh, porous structure. To your left, this is the side view. We turn this particle 90 degree. We can see these parallel stripes. These stripes representing the pores channels. So they str go straight through the cores. The equatorial ones are longest. You go to the polar region, they become shallow. One interesting aspect is that there is no interconnection between these channels. Just like honeycomb, they're all independent and parallel to each other. So why is this advantageous to us? Because we can literally treat them like tiny little sponge ball. Just like sponge, you throw them into any solution, it will soak up whatever is in that solution. So we can make a drug solution, and then we th sprinkle these dry, tiny, itsy litsy uh, sponge particle into the solution. If the, drug, uh, the molecular size of the drug is small enough, they could diffuse into the porous matrix of this material. Then what we did was to drop two giant rocks on both sides of this tunnel and block these drugs from leaking out. And the way that we did it is to use the hinge. Use this linker, and this linker, as I will show, show you, turns out to be chemical or photolabile. That is to say, we could use those external stimuli as the trigger to cut the hinge, pop the cap, and then trigger the release. Now, one thing, the first system that we did was to use something that is very, quite common in biology, this disulfide linkage. So many proteins, particularly antibodies, they use the disulfide bond as their way to form a rigid structure, but they could actually exchange and then do some uh, you know, re refinements of the, the structure. So that is to say, this kind of chemical linkage is cleavable. You could actually cut them. In fact, an antioxidant, such as those, uh, those uh, glutathione that you go to the GNC, you could buy a bottle of that, can cleave this kind of bond. And so, if we use this as a covalent linkage to, to, uh, to connect our, the cap to our uh, porous material, then one could imagine you could actually, by sending in a chemical that could actually reduce this disulfide bond here, then you could perhaps cut these things 
and then allow the cap to diffuse away, then this entrapped you know, drug molecule can quickly follow. And it turns out this strategy was successful. We can indeed make something looks like this. So I would just simply uh, tell you this, these, this lower right uh, plot. Not only we could actually control the, the, the rate of the release, we found a very interesting effect. That is, this is a plot that plotted the, the release concentration, meaning the cargo concentration, against the trigger concentration. What we saw was a threshold, meaning that at the very low trigger concentration, there was almost no release. When, it, when the concentration of the trigger above the threshold here, all of a sudden you have the onslaught, the massive release. And this could be explained by those, I saw a, quite a few chemistry students there, so in case you're a general chemistry TA, here's the lessons. <laughs> so any reversible equilibrium reaction is governed by the equilibrium constant, correct? So the, two re the product of a two reactant has to be larger than equilibrium constant in order for you to drive the reaction from the left to the right. And that is to say, in our scenario, this reaction, this reversible reaction is dictated by the concentration of the linker and the trigger. So if the trigger concentration is too low, you're not going to be able to trigger this reaction in the forward direction. That is to say, no release. Then when your concentration is too high enough, you can trigger the, the release. The one interesting take home message is that this is now a smart particle. That is to say, if you put it in a local environment when you have no trigger, these things will stay put as a loaded gun. Only when you stumble into a local environment, you have high enough the triggers concentration. Then the gate opening will happen. So perhaps we could take advantage of this kind of situation to be able to differentiate a cancer tissue versus a normal tissue. That is to say, if the cancer tissue overexpressed a certain chemical, so that the local concentration of that particular chemical at that particular uh, tissue is much higher than the normal tissue, then this bullets will know when and how to fire. Okay? So you could actually use anything that's large enough to block those pores as the cap. So I'd like to show you one system that we use tiny, tiny little magnet, the iron oxide, as the cap, so that we could encapsulate a gas molecule such as a fluorescent dye inside of this whole assembly. The reason why we like to put a magnet there is that now this whole system will be attractive to external magnetic force. That is to say, you put a magnet there, this whole thing will follow and be accumulated near the, the surface of the magnet. So here is a picture where we have two magnets that's behind these two cuvettes. You can see the agglomerations of these you know, metal filing dark particles around that side of the cuvette. When we send in a chemical trigger, interestingly, 17 hours later, you could actually see the solution now look completely green. That is the color of this fluorescent dye. But in addition to that, you notice that the agglomeration, the color of this agglomeration change, change as well. On the right, this is the control. So this looks completely black. Here, you know, in, in this one, that looks kind of grayish. So if you think about it, the iron oxide is actually black in color. Silica, as you know, just like sand and glass, they're actually white. So if you flip this thing 90 degree, you will see that once we cut the hinge, the only magnetic species are those iron oxide. So they accumulate closer to the magnet that's behind the, the, the screen here. Whereas the white silica particle get elbow out. So you see this kind of grayish color. Another example that I'd like to show you is a movie. Actually, uh, this is Brian Truwin, uh, who is sitting in the audience. Brian is holding a, probably not a cyclone refrigerator, refrigerator but uh, some kind of refrigerator magnet. Uh, so, and what we did was that we take those particle, we, we load them with fluorescent dye, we fed them to a human cervical cancer cells. So then we put the magnet on this side, we accumulate all those cells that have swallowed our particle to the left. And then when I started the movie, Brian's going to move this, this very weak magnet from the left to the right. And I would like you to pay attention 
to what happened to those cells. So you can see a, sort of a light color lining here. Those are the cells. Let me start the movie. Now he's moving the magnet to the right. And hopefully you can see it starts pretty slow. You can see the blob that just jumped. Can you see that? You can see these, these cells, these sort of uh, these blobs that are moving from the left to the right. Okay? And now he's going to move the magnet from the right back to the left. Okay? This time, he didn't let these cells to sort of rest too long. And now you can actually see these cells are coming back much faster. Can you see that? So there are two take-home messages. One is that this is a very weak magnet. The fact that you could actually use the magnet to drag these cells from left and right tells you one thing. Because these are uh, animals, uh, well, actually human cerebral cancer cells. They have the adhesive protein. They tend to latch on to the quartz surface. Oftentimes, you need to trypsonize them. You need to actually destroy those adhesive protein in order to move them. The fact now, without the trypsonization, you can actually move them from left and right, tells you that the number of the particles that get swollen by these cells are in a very large number. And another interesting effect is that the iron oxide is a high dielectric constant material. It will quench the fluorescence when the, for, for the fluorescent species are very close to that a magnet. And the fact we can actually see these cells that are glowing in the sort of blue fluorescent tells you there are already intracellular release that took place. And so we have tested a lot of naturally produced cell produced antioxidant. Turns out we found a molecule that's called a dihydrolipoic acid that is actually quite effective in solvax oxidizing and then reduce this disulfide, which is the hinge of a particle and then trigger the release. Turns out this release is actually quite fast. So that is to say, if we could actually use the system as a tiny little nano rulers and go into all different kinds of the cells to measure the antioxidant level of all these different cell type, and in hope, if this cancer cell shows more of the antioxidant, then we have a smart bullet uh, to cure cancer. I'd like to show you another system that where we put a polymer on the outside of this particle. This polymer is quite interesting. At the room temperature, it's completely soluble in water. The water can go in, so this is hydrophilic. You elevate the temperature slightly to 40 degrees Celsius. All of a sudden, the intracellular hydrogen bonding took over. This whole polymer become hydrophobic. So the reason why we're interested in doing this is that if we could actually coat the silica particle with the rim of this polymer, then perhaps the particle behavior can be altered when it, you know, based on the environment these particles are located and also based on the surrounding temperature. Turns out the strategy also worked. You can actually see that uh, at 25 degree in water, you could disperse these particles, very homogeneously form a suspension, and when you heat it up to 40 degree, all of a sudden, the solution becomes clear. All the particles precipitate down at the bottoms of this, cube, uh, this test tube. If you put an organic solvent on top and then the water at the bottom, the bottom water so, uh, solution looks milky when you have the particles that are evenly dispersed at room temperature. When you heat the temperature up, all of a sudden, this thing becomes clear. These particles fighting their way into the organic phase. The reason why they couldn't go all the way in is because silica is actually quite heavy. Okay? So using a cartoon to represent what happens is that you could, by doing this kind of nanochemistry, you could even alter the nature, the physical natures of these particles from something completely water soluble to something organic soluble. So recently, very recently, one of my students have decided, OK, well, he must take control of this release. He does not want to be at the sort of nature's mercy. So he doesn't want to wait for the natural uh, cell produced antioxidant. He decided to just shine the light. So he decided to put a cap that has a photo lay bio linker. That is to say, once you shine the light to this structure, the bond can be cleaved and then to pop the cap. So it turns out he was successful by 
uh, doing some irradiation, you could actually trigger the release. And he could use this thing to control the timing when he would like to kill a human liver cells. So when it's dark, you could actually see the cells are quite heavily uh, you know, alive. And after the radi irradiations, cells are destroyed. And the cargo he used is actually an anti-cancer cell, uh, well, an anti-tumor drugs, uh, Taxo. So this is to tell you that one could actually use this thing. Now, another thing I'd like to mention to you quickly is that, well, one can actually use a variety of different things as a cap to even change the charge profile of the species. If we put something that's highly positively charged, like this poly, uh, um, amido amine polymer, one can actually change the overall surface charge from negative to positive. The reason why we like to do that is that if you have a particle that's actually highly positive charge, then it could actually electrostatically form a complex with the plasma DNA. So we could actually just, these DNA will be just like the ribbons. We could actually gift wrap this, this, this little gift box. And in addition, we could hide these tiny little drugs inside of the porous matrix. So the idea is to take advantage of this whole structure and hopefully they could behave like the Trojan horse. When you present them to the cell membrane, if they can be swallowed by the cells, if we could find a way to do the intracellular control release, then the DNA could go to the nucleus and do the gene transfection, whereas the drug can come out and, and do its biological functions. So this may be a very simple cartoon. In reality, it's never that quite easy, right? You have so many different methods, uh, mechanisms for a cell to swallow a foreign object, such as nanoparticle, inside uh, this, the plasmid. And suffice to say, regardless of which kind of mechanism, they all end up inside a bubble. That is to say, regardless of the fi uh, you know, uh, phagocytosis or the, these kind of a classroom media endocytosis, your foreign objects the first thing that ends up inside the cell is being wrapped around inside a, a lipid bilayer uh, vesicle. Can we break free from this is the key. Okay. Turns out what we have found is that a, an animal cell can indeed swallow a lot of our particle inside. So you can see this is actually a Chinese hamster ovarian cell. There is a very big nucleus. And all these dark particles are actually our mesoporous nan silicon nanoparticle. So there are, the number is actually you know, above 100 per cell. And they're actually quite biocompatible. As you can see, there are a lot of these funny shapes of the intracellular org organelles. Those are the mitochondria. So many people will think that mitochondria are the power plants of the cell. So when the cell die, these intracellular organisms disappear very, very rapidly. So the fact you can actually see the mitochondria in a very close proximity to the agglomeration of your silica particle, indicating that these sil silica particles are not killing the cell when they're being swallowed. <coughs> this is the slide that my students favorite, that sh here shows one silica particle, two mitochondria here and here, and a wiggling nucleus membrane, and a Golgi. So, this is sort of like you could see that this particle is peaceably coexists with all these intracellular organelles. And the interesting thing that we found is by decorating the outside surface of this particle, we could control how long these things were gift wrapped inside the vesicle, or how fast we want them to come out and start playing with these intracellular organelles inside themselves. So if we use this, they get trapped more than six hours. If we use something like amine, very quickly they come out. So I'm not going into detail of that. We could use the strategy to do gene transfection. These are all the different types of the uh, animal cells. We could reach a, a varieties of the uh, gene transfection efficiencies. These numbers are actually quite high. As you can see, even the primary cells, the neurons, even their dendrites actually shows a high uh, fluorescent intensity. That is, means that the high degrees of the green fluorescent protein expression in this case. Now, we could also make the small pores, as you can see, the separation between the lines are more uh, are closely here in, in comparisons with this. We could actually expand the pore diameter to make something, uh, to make the pores bigger to accommodate a bigger uh, molecule, such as an enzyme. We could actually put 
Acetylchrome C, which is an enzyme that's membrane impermeable, and then we load them inside the particle. We could actually take them through the cell membrane and then release them inside of the cells. As you can see, they started highly localized around the particle, eventually they diffuse, and you could actually see the whole cells now look green fluorescent. Now, this strategy is all good. So we have published a lot of uh, uh, papers in this area to highlight that one could indeed use this Trojan horse approach to accomplish a lot of interesting applications in biomedical uh, area or the biotechnology area. And we sort of ran into a barrier when I started the collaboration uh, with my dear friend Khan Wang in agronomy. As Mike mentioned, that uh, we team up together and in hope to use this kind of nanoparticle technology to be able to accomplish uh, this cell wall penetration uh, challenge. Turns out, all the trick that we learned from the animal st cell study didn't quite work in this case. Turns out we literally have to sugarcoat this particle. So an MMM is always a good thing. Uh, so turns out when you sugarcoat these things, they actually find their way through the cell wall into the cell membrane, uh, into the cell membrane and go inside of the cells. So this is just a sort of a, a you know, these are actually two, two um, uh, plant cells you can actually see without the sugar coating, most of the green particles are outside of the cells. With the sugar coating, they're inside of the plant cells. So we could actually do that. We could do gene transfection, and we will also deliver a chemical, and we could control the timing of this release. So <coughs> we could actually transfect even some very big objects, such as this tobacco leaf here. Okay, you could actually see the green fluorescent spots on this leaf. And so the, all this is good. However, I did not really answer one question. That is, what about this hemolysis, this toxic effect that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk? It turns out, lots of people study, why is the silica particle so damaging to the red blood cells? Turns out there is a good reason. The silicate, which is an anionic species, like to hang around with this sort of tertiary ammonium groups on the red blood cell membrane. So the more of this kind of electrostatic attraction that you have, the tighter these two objects will combine with each other. And in some cases, these particles that actually have enough of the binding with the cell membrane to change the shape of the cells. So that is to say, when you throw some silica particle to the red blood cells, instead of having a smooth cell surface, now you see these kind of spikes. So this speculation it's one of the reasons why this membrane now is being twisted to the strange form, and then eventually it ruptures and the cell dies. And we were quite surprised when we start investigating and compare our particle, which is shapes like this. This is a morphous silica. Okay, the scale bar is, pretty, is the same, 50 nanometer here, 50 nanometer there. Okay, so I'd like to drive your attention to this photo, photograph here that when you put the red blood cell in the pure ion-free water, then obviously because of this osmotic pressure, the red blood cells will, will release all the cargo. And then you could actually see, once we centrifuge it down, the cells remains are at the bottom. Okay? You look at the supernatum, it's actually quite red. All the hemoglobin was released up here. When we put the morphous silica, same thing happens. You could actually see the supernatums are indeed very, very red. If you use just a PBS buffer, meaning a ionic, highly ionic water solution that these cells like to be in, they're quite happy. The supernatant is completely clear. Whereas in this case, when we introduce our mesoporous silicon nanoparticle, after the centrifuge, we see that the, the supernatants are actually clear, uh, very, very clear. That is to say, in contrast to this hemolysis effect that is commonly observed with the amorphous silica, our mesoporous silicon nanosphere would not trigger that. Now the question is why? Well, we are obviously very happy about this result because that means our particle is actually quite biocompatible. Now, if we compare the amount of these anionic groups on the solid spherical particle versus our particle, we were in a great surprise because if you count the number of those silicate groups, ours is at least 20 times more because we have such a huge surface area, because all these pores, they all have the silicate. However, because they're inside the pores, these 
silicate groups are not accessible to the cell membrane because the cell is a much bigger object than our particle. So that is to say, allow me to use this analogy, nobody would like to drive on the New York Highway or let's say in these days would be Southern California is the same thing because they're full with potholes. Okay, so you are in the bumpy ride. And in fact, this is very similar in our case. Instead of having a smooth surface where all these silicate groups are accessible to the, membrane, the cell membrane, so the cell membrane will sort of wrap around this object and cause the speculation. In our case, every so many nanometer, there is a big vacuum, there's a big gap that these cell membranes will have to jump over to reach out to another binding spots. So almost that this is the, you know, this is the basketball, whereas this is a golf ball. Okay. So this indentation, this pore structure, prevents a close association between the cell membrane and the silica particle. So in fact, by creating this unique structure, these guys are now biocompatible. Okay. Now I'm going to quickly switch gear, uh, and I know I don't have much time left, but I'd like to tell you the other type of research we do. It has something to do with using the same kind of mesoporous material for catalysis application, particularly biofuel. The reason why we're interested in biofuel, well, one reason is, again, you know, you could get some research funding being in Iowa, and that's the, you know, honest uh, truth. The other thing is that, you know, we must live in a sustainable society. Well, many of you have seen this kind of pictures. Well, this is the Upsala Glacier in Argentina, 1928, covered with thick ice, 2004. Well, all the ice melted. So this, of course, you've seen lots of this picture, global warming, right? So is global warming for real or not? Living in Iowa, sometimes hard to believe that, but particularly this winter. However, I like the following slides. This is very convincing to me. If you look at the ladies' underwear, 18th century, this is what it looks like. Now we're over here. Okay. I think the debate is over, personally. Okay. So there is a global warming. Okay. So, well, since we're now, so we cannot continue to burn the fossil fuel. We must find a way to live in a sustainable society. That is to say, we got to look at our ancestors. What did they do? They use all these things around them, like garbage, agricultural crops, grass, biomass. They use these things for energy. They sometimes even use this to make wines, cheese. Well, I don't know, in some part of the world, I think they do use some garbage to make fermented species. However, the, the kind of a conventional, we live in the petroleum-based society. That is to say, all these refinery infrastructures are geared towards those hydrocarbons that is completely hydrophobic. We don't have to worry about the corrosion. Now we're in, in, a, in a big surprise. We have to deal with these biological species. A lot of them are water soluble. One big problem of the ethanol industry in, in the state of Iowa is transportation. They cannot use the oil pipeline because they didn't make, those pipelines wasn't made of stainless steel. So if you charge the ethanol into the pipeline, it will corrode those pipelines. That's why all the ethanol has to be trained or trucked. So the economical radius of transporting the ethanol that's produced in Iowa can only reach out to Chicago, 350 miles. That's the economical radius. It cannot go to California, it cannot go to New York. So can we use the nanotechnology to help to create new catalysts or the refinery methods to help to eliminate or overcome some of these technology uh, challenge? I'd like to give you one example that is something I like um, to work with in the past three, four years now. I like to convert oil to biodiesel. This is a very simple chemical reaction. You take this molecule called triglyceride, you cut between this carbon and oxygen bond, you put the methanol here, this OME here, you replace this molecule with that. You end up having a methyl ester. This is biodiesel, side product is glycerin. Very simple reaction. But if you look, we're in Iowa. We are we definitely in, in no shortage of soybean. However, if you look, this is 2007. How many biodiesel plants in the United States? 86. 2006. The majority is actually in the Midwest and the Southeast. Of course, these are agricultural states. Now, now 
we have approximately 151 biodiesel producing factories. Okay. So the number is greatly increasing. And one thing I'd like to point out is even Hawaii got two biodiesel plants. <laughs> okay. So obviously this is a booming industry. Now, but if you look, 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 now,